Okay, so we're continuing our series called Live Like a King, and this is the longest series I've ever done uh, since I've been a lead pastor, and I'm not sorry. What we see today is that David is now in his mid-30s about. He's living in Jerusalem, and he's experienced experiencing a level of success as king. Um, He is enjoying the fruits of his labor. He's brought the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem, which we've talked about. And so things are going pretty well for this guy. Finally, am I right? I mean, he's gone through a hard time. He's been persecuted. He's been chased. He's had to fight giants and armies. And so here's where we're picking up in 2 Samuel chapter 11. And if you have a Bible, you can turn there. We're going to put it up on the screen for you to read along. And I encourage you to read along so you know what we're talking about. The word of God that we read um, when we're in this part of the service is so much more important than the words that come out of my mouth. The word of God is living and active and it changes us. So open your heart up to this and God will speak to you through his word throughout this message. Starting in verse 1. It says, in the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. Late one afternoon, after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. As he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. He sent someone to find out who she was, and he was told she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her, and when she came to the palace, he slept with her. She had just completed the purification rites after having her menstrual period. Then she returned home. Later, when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, she sent David a message saying, I'm pregnant. Uh Uh-oh. So this series is called Live Like a King, and in the life of King David, there are a lot of lessons that we can learn and valuable principles that we can apply to our lives. But as you've seen, this is not one of those moments. David faced temptation the way that we all face temptation, and that's what I want to talk to you about today, how to resist like a king, how to resist like a king. Uh, We face temptation. We have to learn how to resist Temptation. I want to pray for us. God, I thank you for your word and your presence here. Lord, I ask that your spirit would come and just work in our hearts because this is a difficult subject to talk about. As we talk about temptation, it brings up a lot of feelings and and emotions of things that we wrestle with, God. And I pray that right now your spirit would come and comfort us and lead us into life and your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Verse 1 said, In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. That's what we read. David was normally going to go out to war this time of the year, but he stayed behind. We don't really know why he stayed behind, only that he really should have been out with the troops fighting the battle. I I don't know if maybe he had just had enough. I know when I was in the army and I, I deployed to Iraq, at the end of that year, I was like, I'm out. Peace. I've had enough of this, right? I'm ready to go home and let someone else take it from here. Maybe David felt like that. He fought for years and for years, and maybe he was just worn out and tired. Maybe he wanted to just rest and enjoy the fruits of his labor. I don't know. Maybe his advisors were saying, King David, you're too valuable. We can't afford to lose you in battle. We need you to, to stay put where it's safe. All we know is he should have been with the army, but he was in the palace. And there in the palace, he got himself into trouble. He was not where he was supposed to be. He was not doing what he was supposed to do. And so he stumbled into danger as he wandered around bored. And here's the first point of this message. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. If you don't take notes, write this down. It's without purpose, you'll find problems. Without purpose, you'll find problems. There are few things in life more dangerous than a bored man. Am I right? Like God designed us men for adventure. And if you're not living your life the way that God designed you to live it, all that pent up energy is going to come out one way or another. And I'll be honest, a bored woman is equally as dangerous. Right? You get yourself on the Internet reading all kinds of crazy things. There's an old Christian saying that an idle mind is the devil's workshop. And I don't usually like Christian sayings because a lot of times they're not true. Like there's one, cleanliness is next to godliness. That's not a thing. That's not in the Bible. It's not, it's not in any way. Tr- cleanliness prevents stinkiness. 
And that's good, but I don't like making up things. But this is actually biblically true in a lot of ways. The idle hands are the devil's tools. It's really, it's true. It's like when you're busy, when you're really engaged, it's hard to get yourself into trouble. I know that feeling. Like when you're really tired, when you're on mission, when you're pursuing your purpose, by the time the end of the day comes and your head hits the pillow, you don't have energy left to worry about what tomorrow's going to bring. You don't really have the energy left to, to criticize other people and gossip about what the neighbors are doing. You're just like, yo, give me something to eat. And and get me in bed, right? And I'd be honest, I think that for American Christians, rest has become a little bit of an idol. God has said, on the seventh day, you shall rest. And rest is a good thing. Sabbath day rest is a good thing. But I think in some ways, we've overinflated the value of rest, and we've pursued rest at the expense of engaging in the mission that God has called us to. Let me be honest. Our problem as a church is not that we're not getting enough rest. It's that we're not busy doing the things that God has called us to do. And so, yeah, I didn't think you were going to clap loud for that. But God's called us on this mission to rescue the lost, to seek and save the lost the way that Jesus has. And that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be engaged in this mission. When you're busy rescuing the lost, it's hard. It's, it's hard to sin. It's hard to give in to temptation because you're busy. You're engaged. If you're going in and out of a burning building rescuing people, you don't have time to stop and check your makeup in the mirror. You're busy. You've got things to do. You've got places to go. And that's why we need to live our lives with purpose, the purpose that God has called us to. God has called you to a purpose for a reason and he wants you busy and engaged fighting the fight Jesus will bring rest to your souls as you continue to follow your purpose and fight the fight first Corinthians 9 verse 25 says all athletes are disciplined in their training they do it to win a prize that will fade away but we do it for an eternal prize so I run with purpose in every step I'm going to read that again. I run with purpose in every step. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. And watch this. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Here's what that means. The Apostle Paul is talking. And he's saying we need to run like an athlete with purpose in every step. We need to train ourselves and discipline our bodies to live life with purpose. Otherwise, he's saying, I fear that I'm going to get up here as an apostle. I'm going to preach to you about Jesus, and then I'm going to disqualify myself from ministry by giving into temptation or getting involved in things that I should not be doing. Wow. Temptation can pull you away from your purpose. Yeah. And if you're not careful to live your life engaged on purpose with discipline, I know nobody wants to talk about discipline. I know nobody woke up today and was like, let's go to church and talk about discipline. Let's learn about how we can be more disciplined. Nobody wants that. But in reality, God says that if you'll be more disciplined, if you'll engage in your purpose, I will help you avoid temptation. I will help you to keep yourself out of trouble and not do the things that you don't want to do. Here's the truth. When you're engaged, it becomes hard to sin. Or I should say it becomes harder to sin. There's always a way to sin if you want. But when you're engaged in God's mission, it becomes harder to sin. And so in our, in our survey, we talked about some aspects of engagement, uh, like, like different things, church attendance, life group serving, uh, giving, those kind of things. But let me just, let me just kind of highlight this for a minute. Like, uh, if you know you're going to church on Sunday morning, it becomes harder to go out on Saturday night and get drunk, Right? Like, it just does. Like, you could, but you're like, ah, I got to get up in the morning, and Pastor Ryan's mic's going to be really loud. I don't want to be hung over. Maybe you're here right now hung over, and you're like, please, just quiet. Shh, softer. I'm glad you're at church if you're hung over right now. You're in the right place. <laughs> it's hard to be selfish and think of myself only when I'm busy serving other people. You know, if I'm serving you, it just takes the focus off of me. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I think about the passage we read. It said that David, he sent Joab out to war with the soldiers. He sent Joab, the general, out to lead his troops into battle. He sent Joab out to do the thing that he should have done. Right. 
Okay, and, and I got to be honest, as a Christian, there have been a lot of times that I've sat back and been lazy and let other people do the thing that I should have been doing. But when I'm busy serving, it keeps me engaged and it keeps me doing what I should be doing. I was made to serve. I was born to serve. God said, hey, if you want to be great, you've got to be a servant. The son of man himself, Jesus, he did not come to be served, but to serve others. So serving is important. Um, Think about giving. When I put God first in my finances and I give to him first, it makes it hard to handle the rest of my finances without any vision or purpose. When, When I put God first and I prioritize him, it forces me to be disciplined with the rest of my spending. It then becomes hard to overspend and live paycheck to paycheck. See how it helps us to be engaged. When I'm in a life group, if I have a group of people in community with me who love me, like God made us to be in community, like, I'm glad you're here in Ahwatukee and in Mesa. We're all together. Um, he made us to be in community together. When you have that community, it becomes easier to avoid sin because a lot of the sin we get into is because of loneliness and a lack of community, right? Like, you'll be uh, uh, hard-pressed. You won't feel the same need to jump into an unhealthy dating relationship because of loneliness when you're living in community, A lot of pornography addictions start because of loneliness and a desire for intimacy, much more so than than just lust or, or anything like that. It's more about intimacy and the desire to be with someone, to feel connected. But in community, it it becomes harder. You don't need that in the same way when you're in a life group, when you're connected to other people. Or or I think about like uh, engagement in this way. We talked about inviting people to church, talking about Jesus. Look, it's hard to curse someone out in the parking lot of Target for taking your spot if you know you're about to invite them to church with you on Sunday. Right? Like, I'm really mad right now, but I want to invite that person to Generation Church on Sunday, so I'm going to zip it, right? It's just just easier. When you're engaged, it becomes harder to sin. David was not engaged. King David was sitting on his rear end in the palace, not doing what he was supposed to be doing. Let's be honest. King David handled hardship better than he did success. When he was going through hard times, He was mindful to rely on God because he had no other option. But when he was successful, when things slowed down, he became disengaged, he became distracted, and he got himself into trouble. So here's the key for us. Don't let success distract you from your purpose. Right? God has blessed us and allowed us to live in a country where we're not being persecuted, where you can come to church on Sunday and not worry about being arrested for it. Um, we're the most financially affluent country in the history of the world. We have things today that in history only kings and queens had. So this series, Live Like a King, you're doing it. <laughs> okay, like You've got a lot of stuff, and, and that's not bad. You shouldn't feel guilty about it, but success and comfort can distract us from our calling. And it can become easy to drift. So I'd say, like Paul talked about, run your race to avoid running out of control. Run with purpose so you don't stumble into problems. Without purpose, you will find problems. Verse two says, after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace and he looked out over the city And he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. He wakes up from his nap. Must be nice to be king, right? Your soldiers are out fighting in in the battle. They're out at war, and you're taking a midday nap. You're like, excuse me, it's time for my second nap today. Um, I'm going to go take a nap. And then he gets up, and he goes for a leisurely stroll on the palace rooftop. Nothing wrong with that. No big deal. And as he's walking along, he notices a beautiful naked woman. And he's like, what? What? Okay, now, now I just want to make this clear. The fact that he noticed her and was tempted in this moment, he wasn't sinning yet. And this is my next point. Temptation is not a sin. Temptation is not a sin. This is very important that you understand this today. The fact that you feel tempted does not mean that you have sinned. When David noticed this woman, in many ways, he might not have been able to help it. Like, just biologically, the way we're wired to, att- to notice attractive things, you know? Like, I notice ice cream anywhere I see it. Like, I, I can't help it. I'm just like, what ice cream? 
And David, David probably noticed. He's like, oh, attractive woman. And, and so he was tempted in that moment. Like, let's be honest, any guy would have been. You see an attractive, beautiful, naked woman taking a bath, and you're like, what is that? Your brain like knows something's going on. And let's be honest, ladies. Ladies notice attractive people, too. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> All right. And so it's hard. It's hard to avoid that double take moment. It's hard. Temptation is this. It's the presentation of an appealing opportunity to sin. Being tempted is saying, hey, man, there's a moment here where I'm drawn to something that's not right. That's what temptation is. I have the opportunity to sin if I, if I want to, and I'm feeling a pull towards it. I'm feeling drawn to it. We all had friends growing up, friends who got us into trouble. Yeah. You know, friends who would say, hey, man, like, don't let him get away with that. Hey, hey, hey uh, we don't have any money, so let's just take it. You know, like, just, just take it, bro. Like, you won't get caught. Oh, I remember I had friends like this. You're going to let him talk to you like that? You got to put him in his place. And it's like, oh, yeah, you're right. Let's, let's fight after, after school on the playground. Uh, you know, guys would say things to each other like, man, you get with her yet? You know, you should. Right? People tempt each other. People tempt each other. And in the same way today, you probably don't listen to your stupid friends anymore, but you do have an enemy, the devil, who does tempt you. He wants to tempt you to sin. And this is something that we all experience. We are all tempted. Nobody is exempt from temptation. You as a human being living on planet earth are not going to get to the place where you are so holy and spiritual that you never feel tempted anymore. In Matthew chapter four, verse one, it says, then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. Jesus was tempted. Temptation comes from the devil, and it appeals to our human nature. And, and, and as a human being, we have a sinful nature. And so the, the devil, he will tempt us. He will appeal to our human nature. He knows how to tempt you. Now, I'm going to talk about spiritual things for a moment here. God is all-knowing. He knows everything, all of our thoughts and our feelings and our desires. The devil and, and his forces, demonic forces, they don't know everything. The devil does not know what's in your mind. He doesn't know what you're thinking. Um, he doesn't know everything the way that God does, okay? So you need to understand that. But he has been watching mankind for thousands of years. C.S. Lewis talks about this in Mere Christianity. He talks about how the devil and his demonic forces, they have been watching us, and they know how to effectively tempt us. The, the enemy, honestly, can observe us to a certain extent and learn what things are most likely to trip us up. And I say this in order, to under, in order to communicate so we can understand that he's very crafty, he's very clever, and he's strategic. Yeah. He is going to tempt you in a way that uh, it appeals to you in the areas where you're vulnerable. Right. He knows where you're vulnerable. He's clever in how he tempts us. He's no dummy at this. In fact, he was even clever how he tempted Jesus. Jesus was in the wilderness fasting for 40 days. First, he appealed to his hunger and he said, hey, turn these stones into bread. And he then appealed to his nature as the son of God. He was fully man, but also fully God. And he said to Jesus, the enemy, the devil, he said, if you are the son of God, then prove it and throw yourself off this roof and send you know, your angels to catch you. And, and, and I'm sure there was a part of Jesus as the son of God that did want to prove it, right? And then I think about how Jesus, he, he came to establish his kingdom on this earth, and the devil tempted him by appealing to his desire. And I think he said, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you the whole kingdom of the earth. He was clever in how he even tempted Jesus. But Jesus refuted his temptation. He blocked it and resisted it by speaking the word of God and reminding himself of truth. And the devil had to flee. He did. So we're all going to be tempted and he knows how to tempt us. He's going to tempt us in different ways, not just sexually, but financially. He's going to tempt us and appeal to our greed, to our laziness. He's going to tempt us to want to criticize other people and speak negative words, criticize leaders. He's going to tempt us um, with substances. He's going to tempt us to doubt God and God's goodness. He's going to tempt us in a lot of ways, and he knows how to do it. He knows how to swoop in at the right time when something just went wrong in your life and tempt you to doubt the goodness of God. He knows how to swoop in when you're 
you're the most tired, when you feel lonely and tempt you to comfort yourself with some substance that is destructive. He knows what he's doing. So we have to be on guard against this. We have to watch out. We're all tempted. We're not above it. I'm tempted as a pastor. I'm still tempted sometimes. Sometimes I'm in this very building. I'm at our Awatuki campus, and I'm tempted to smack a person in the face. <laughs> I'm just being honest. And I'm like, is it okay? Jesus flipped over tables and cracked whips. So, I mean, but I'm not Jesus, so I don't know if I trust myself to make that judgment call. But I'm tempted. Right? Because people say dumb things and they do things that I know are going to hurt them. And I'm thinking like, man, if I could just smack a little sense into him, literally smack a little sense. But then I don't do it because, you know, it's tempting, but I I haven't done it yet. And I'm praying, don't push me, but I haven't done it yet. (laughs) And the devil wants you to believe that just being tempted makes you a bad Christian. He wants you to believe that just feeling tempted makes you a sinner. He wants you to think that when you're tempted to sin, God is already disappointed with you. But temptation is not a sin. Jesus never sinned, and yet he was tempted. He never sinned, but he was tempted. That proves to us that temptation is not a sin. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, it says, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. I like this passage because one of the lies the enemy will say to us is, man, the way you're being tempted right now, you are disgusting. You're a terrible, sorry excuse for a Christian. God is probably so disappointed with you right now. How could he love you? You don't deserve to be loved. You've been a Christian for how long and you still want to do that? But this passage reminds us the temptations that we feel are no different than what other people experience. You're not alone. You're not the only one. You're not feeling anything that someone else hasn't already felt. You're not dealing with anything that someone else isn't dealing with. And the reminder is that God is faithful. He has not abandoned us to be tempted by an enemy without any help. It says he will show you a way out. He will show you a way out so that you can endure. He will help you resist temptation so that you can endure in this life, so that you don't have to fall into trouble, so that you don't have to experience heartache. And here's my next point. You can write this down. Resist temptation to avoid devastation. Resist temptation to avoid devastation. David, he failed. King David failed. And it was devastating. The consequences were terrible. He liked what he saw, and then he sinned when he chose to act on the temptation. He didn't sin just by seeing someone. He sinned when he started to act on that temptation. Verse 3 said, He sent someone to find out who she was, and he was told she's Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Keyword, the wife of... Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her, and when she came to the palace, he slept with her. One of Satan's favorite lies when he tempts us is to tell us, this isn't going to hurt anyone. It's consequence-free. It's a victimless crime. What you choose to do in your own time isn't going to hurt anyone. No one has to know. That's one of his favorite tricks, isn't it? In fact, you've probably heard him saying that to you at one point. Like, it's not going to hurt anything. Just go ahead and do it. And in fact, in the world that we live in today, the culture has bought the lie from Satan. And the culture says, if it feels like something you should do, then you should do it. If it feels good, do it. If you feel a desire to sin, that's because God made you that way. And you should sin. You don't need to stop yourself from doing what you want to do. God wants you to be happy. And lie. Lie. Temptation leads to sin if we give in, and that leads to devastation, and it does hurt us. We don't just fall into sin. We allow temptation to pull us away from the truth that God has already spoken. And it doesn't just happen all at once. It's usually a process like we see with David. First, he noticed a beautiful woman rub-a-dub-dub scrubbing in the tub. And he could have been like, whoa, 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 I, shouldn't, I should not be looking at that. I need to go and get my boys together and play some checkers and distract myself or, or something, right? But instead, he, he, he obviously, he double-taked, and he's like, whoa, whoa, I like, I like that. And uh, 
Then he called his servant over and he said, um, who is that? And I don't know what the servant was thinking, like, like who? The naked lady? Why? Why do you want to know? He's probably thinking, well, you know, I'm the king. Uh, it's my job to know things about my subjects. I just want to know. You know. Do you want to know about those kids playing hide and go seek over there or just the pretty naked lady, right? And I'm sure he thought, like, it's harmless just to ask a question about who it is. I just, it's just information. Information's not going to hurt anything. But he's told, oh, that's Bathsheba, the wife of your friend Uriah the Hittite. Uriah was David's boy. And so instead of being like, oh, whoa, my bad, uh, she's taken. Uh, then he continues to act on temptation. And he says, uh, go get her. Go get her. I don't, I don't even know if at that point, maybe he, maybe he didn't even know what he was going to do. Maybe he, maybe he was lying to himself and saying, it's not going to hurt anyone. We're just going to have a little conversation. You know, I go talk politics, talk about the weather, talk about sports, something like that. You know, conversation never hurt anyone. He could have said like, oh, no, never mind. She's off limits. I'm going to go get out of it. But instead, he made it worse, and he continued down the path. He said, go get her. And then I think about the fact that the servant went to get her, and he was waiting for her to arrive. He had to wait. He's in his palace. He's waiting for another man's wife to come and meet up with him. And there was time that went by. It's one thing to let your blood boil up in a moment and get caught up in a moment of passion. But he had time. He had time to catch his breath. And, and I think he could have been like, whoa, whoa, wait a second. I got... I got a little carried away there for a minute, but what am I, what am I doing right now? Like, what am I about to do? I need to stop this. I need to say, never mind, send her away. Uh, this was a bad idea. But instead it says she came and he slept with her. He slept with her. And it didn't just happen, did it? Right? I, I always sadly laugh in a way when people tell me about their affairs and things that just happened. They don't just happen. First you messaged each other, and then you started talking, and then you kept talking, and then you sent pictures, and then you talked about hypothetically meeting up, and then you did meet up, and then you kept meeting up, and then you slept together. It didn't just happen. You didn't trip and fall into the person and have sex with them. <laughs> like, oops, no, I hate it when that happens. No, no, no. He sent for her. She came. He seduced her. They had sex. This is why 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, run from sexual sin. Only, only sin in the Bible that we're warned to run from. Run away. Like, if you only hear me saying one thing today, run away. Yeah. Run from sexual sin. God knew that we needed to be especially warned about sexual sin and temptation because if you give it an inch, it takes a mile. It's so easy to feed the thoughts and feed the fantasy, and it becomes a monster that is out of control. And that's why God warns us, don't let yourself be in this situation. Don't flirt with it. Don't play with it. Don't go out to lunch with it. Don't talk to it. Deny it and run away. Flee. It's dangerous. It's easier said than done. But it's something we should do. We're warned in Proverbs 5, as Proverbs 5 talks about wisdom, and it says to a young man, it says, uh, her feet go down to death, her steps lead to the grave. It's talking about sexual immorality, and metaphorically, the promiscuous woman, which is sexual immorality, and it's saying this leads to death. It leads to the grave. That is a serious warning. Sexual immorality, it causes death. It kills things. It kills hopes. It kills relationships. It kills dreams. Right, And so we're warned to run away. And it proves true for David. Not only did he, he sleep with his friend's wife, but then he found out she got pregnant. And so instead of coming clean and repenting and apologizing and owning it and taking his moment of embarrassment, but, but laying it down before God, and, and instead he made it worse. It did lead to death. It did lead to the grave when he sent his friend Uriah into battle and told the generals, allow him to be killed. He murdered his friend to cover up his affair. Do you think he had one of those moments that we've all had where you go, how did I get here? Like, how did this even happen? And it just, one day at a time, one compromise at a time, ignoring, ignoring the Holy Spirit warning us, and it just leads to something that, that gets out of control. And it makes me think of this saying, sin takes you further than you wanted to go, 
keeps you longer than you wanted to stay and costs you more than you wanted to pay. Isn't that true? Come on, you know it's true. It always costs more than you wanted to pay. Man, it's not worth it, is it? There is no such thing as consequence-free sin. That is a lie. The enemy will say, hey, this doesn't have any consequences. It's harmless. It's innocent. But that's not true. I know people who are heroin addicts who started out casually smoking pot with some friends. I know people who are divorced and it started out with pornography. I know people that were expelled and it started out with cheating. I know people that were fired and it started out with stealing. I know people that don't have any friends because nobody trusts them and it started out out with a little bit of lying or a little bit of gossiping. I know people who are paying child support and raising kids by themselves. It started out with one night stand. There are no consequence free sins. That's a lie from the enemy. And I'm here to warn you today and speak truth to you as your pastor. Temptation asks you to do what feels good in exchange for what is good. God wants what is good for you, and the enemy tempts you to do what feels good today. Trade what feels good today for God's best in your future. Train a few moments of jollies for a lifetime of joy. The enemy wants you to train long, trade long-term satisfaction for, for short-term sparkle, right? And it's not... It's not really a good trade. It's not when you think about, you know, uh, getting even with someone and taking revenge. And, and man, there's probably been people in your life who've hurt you so bad, some of you, who, that you honestly thought it would feel good to kill that person. But trading that feeling for a lifetime in prison it's not a good trade, is it? Like the, the appeal of adultery, it might feel good in a way. There might be a feeling of excitement or pleasure, but it leads to divorce and the loss of your spouse and the, dis, uh, the loss of uh, respect from your friends and you might lose your house and, and, and just so much devastation that comes from giving in to temptation. If sin can be appealing, but as it draws you in, it's drawing you into a trap. Like Star Wars said, it's a trap. It's a trap. It draws you in. It keeps you longer than you wanted to stay, and it costs you more than you ever wanted to pay. The results of sin will not be good, even if it feels good for a moment. And so I want you to hear this today. If you only hear this, hear this. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. If you don't remember anything else from this whole message, church, repeat after me. It's not worth it. Because there's going to be a moment where you see something and, and it appeals to you. And it's like, ooh, shiny, I want it. But you got to remind yourself, you're going to hear my voice. It's, gonna, it's not worth it. And you're going to be like, get out of my head, Pastor Ryan. But I'm coming back and it's actually the Holy Spirit. It's not worth it. Avoid this temptation so that you can avoid devastation. A few minutes of pleasure is not worth a lifetime of consequence. Sin might seem sexy, but nothing is less sexy than the consequences of sin. So in Matthew 26, 41, we're warned, keep watch and pray. Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Can't you relate to that? I know I can. I mean, I want to do what's right. Like Apostle Paul said, I want to do what's right, but sometimes I do the things that I don't want to do. And I don't do the things that I do want to do. God put that in the Bible just so you would know you're not alone. We're all in the same struggle together, and the enemy is roaring like a lion. He's prowling around looking to devour you, and so we're warned. Keep watch and pray. Stand guard. Watch out. Be on alert. It leads to devastation. And it can seem hopeless, I think, uh, when you feel tempted. A lot of times you'll struggle with those feelings, and you'll feel like, man, I can never, I can never get victory over this. And so I want to encourage you as we come to the end of this message. Resistance requires assistance. I'm in a rhyming mood this weekend. Resistance requires assistance. You need help. You need help. David did not resist temptation. And the results were tragic. They were devastating. And we're going to talk next week about repentance and how to repent of sin when you do fall and how God forgives us when we repent. So you want to be here for that. 
So we have to learn how to resist like a king, but we're not talking about King David, are we? We're talking about King Jesus. Where David failed, King Jesus was successful at resisting the temptation that the enemy presented to him. He said, get out of here. Matthew chapter 4, I'm going to read it to you. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil went away and angels came and took care of Jesus. He said, get out of here. And the devil went away. He resisted and the enemy fled. James says to us, resist temptation. It says, resist the devil. Resist the devil and he will flee. Resist the devil and he will flee. People oftentimes, they misquote that verse, and they'll say, demons have to flee at the mention of Jesus' name. No, they don't. It says, resist the devil, and he will flee. That's not as fun sounding, is it? It'd be nice if there was a magic name you could say that would cause the enemy to run away. But you know what does cause him to flee? Your resistance of temptation. And here's the good thing. The, The Lord is going to help you resist. He is going to help you, church. And so here's what Hebrews 2.18 says, for because he himself has suffered when tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. This word suffered in Greek, it talks about feelings and, and anxiety. It's actually saying that Jesus, when he was tempted, it was appealing to his feelings in some way. He was suffering in that moment, being tempted. He, he wasn't above it. He had allowed himself to be made fully man in addition to being fully God. So he can relate to our feelings of being tempted. Because he knows what it's like to be tempted, he can help you when you're being tempted. That's good. Because honestly, we cannot resist on our own. We can't. This is one of those moments where we got to be honest and say, in our own strength, we cannot resist temptation. But fortunately, we're not doing this in our own strength. Fortunately, The Lord loved us enough to say, I'm going to help you to resist temptation. I'm going to give you strength to resist. So you're not in this alone. The Lord Jesus is going to provide the assistance that you need. And let me talk about that, how that works. Um, The Native American chief sitting bull said this, inside me there are two dogs. One is mean and evil and the other is good and they fight each other all the time. When asked which one wins, I answer the one I feed the most. This has direct correlation to the spiritual struggle that we uh, all face, where we wrestle inside between our flesh and our spirit, and our spirit wants to do what's right, and our flesh wants to do what's wrong oftentimes. And when asked which one wins, the truth is whatever one you feed the most. I'm going to explain this. Galatians chapter 5 says, So I say, walk by the spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, And the spirit, what is contrary to the flesh. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Didn't even leave anything out, did it? Did it, right? Like, if you're reading this, you're like, got him. Right. (laughs) Something on there. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is different. It's love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So the Holy Spirit is going to help you. It says, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. It says that when we belong to Christ Jesus, all of us who've placed our faith in Jesus here, what happens is that spiritually you are changed, and when we choose to follow Jesus, we are choosing to no longer give in to our fleshly desires. In fact, the imagery that the Bible uses is us crucifying our flesh to the cross the way that Jesus was, saying, I'm going to kill the flesh in order to live like Jesus. And so when the world says, if it feels good, do it, the Bible says, no, put your fleshly desires to death. Kill them so that you might live for Christ. And God's going to help you to do it. God's going to help you in this area as you feed your spirit. How do you feed your spirit? That's an important question. And we're going to get real practical as we close this message out. The way to feed your spirit, it's simple. There are things you can do like prayer. When you pray and talk to God, 
It feeds your spirit. It builds up your spirit. In fact, in another series, I talked about how praying in tongues builds you up. If you've been filled with the Holy Spirit and you have the ability to pray in another language, to pray in tongues, I do that. It builds me up. That's what the Bible says. It builds me up. Why do I do it? Because it builds me up. It builds up my spirit. Uh, Reading the Bible, it feeds your spirit. When Jesus was tempted, he quoted the word of God to the devil. When you read the word of God, it builds up your spirit. When you watch stuff you shouldn't watch that has stuff in it you know isn't right, that does not feed your spirit. It feeds your flesh. It does. It, right? it, when you're coming together with God's people, like right now, when you're with God's people, that feeds your spirit. Being with other Christians who love the same Lord and love you, it builds you up. It gives you strength. So feed your spirit. As you feed the Holy Spirit, Inside of you, uh, it turns up the volume on his voice in your heart. You'll hear him more clearly. You'll sense his leading more clearly. He'll help you resist uh, sin. It changes you from the inside out. I want to talk about how he helps us. Romans 8, 26. It says, the spirit helps us in our weakness. Aren't you grateful for that? Come on, give God praise one time if you're grateful. We're all weak. We need help. And Jesus loved us enough to send his spirit to everyone who believes in him. The Holy Spirit dwells inside all believers and helps us in our weakness. So good. Um, Here's how he helps us. First, he makes sin obvious. It said in Galatians, the flesh desires, uh, these acts of the flesh, they're obvious. They're obvious. That's why sometimes you see something going down and you just know in your heart it's wrong. Even if you haven't heard a sermon about it, you might be like, man, I need to ask one of my pastors, like, if that's okay. Uh, I I don't know what the Bible says about this, but but the Holy Spirit can speak to you and make it obvious when sin is happening. That's why some things happen sometimes, and you're like, oh, this is not good. I I need to get out of here. This is not right. I don't even know why. I just know it's not good. So he highlights it for you. He says, hey, that's, that's not right. He's going to help you. He's going to speak to you in your heart. You're going to have a feeling like, ugh, this is not pleasing to God. He's going to make it obvious. He warns us, run away. Get out. That's not good for you. It's going to hurt you. Number two, he empowers us to resist. He gives you the strength to resist because you could not resist on your own. So he empowers you to resist. He gives you strength, right? So you have no excuse to say, I couldn't help myself. It's not true. You cannot say, I could not stop myself. That's not true. Remember we read, he will always give you a way out so that you can endure. He will always show you a way out. And his spirit will strengthen you to resist. I can resist. I can look away. I can change the subject. I can put that substance down. I can say no. I can ignore the message. Whatever it is, the Holy Spirit will give me the strength to do it. It might not be easy. It probably won't be sometimes, but he will help you see the way out and he'll give you the strength to take the way out. Next, third, he convicts us. He convicts us. And that word convicts, it's another word for convince. He convinces us when we do sin that it wasn't right and that we need to make it right. And we should never confuse the conviction of the Holy Spirit with the condemnation that comes from Satan. Okay? Satan will condemn you when you sin, church. He condemns you. He guilt trips you. And it sounds like this. He'll say things like, God can't love you anymore. Uh, The fact that you struggle with this is just terrible. You're the worst Christian that's ever lived. And uh, you're a sad excuse for, he'll say things like this. You should just run away from God. Just get away. Just hide because he must be so disappointed in in you right now. That's what the enemy says. That's called condemnation. Remember, it says that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you ever hear a voice like that, you can say confidently to the devil, no, there is no condemnation for me. I'm in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes along and he convicts us. And it sounds like this. He'll say, hey, that wasn't right. You know that wasn't right, but I'm going to help you to do what's right. I'm going to show you a better way. I'm going to help you to do it better. I have something better for you. And whereas the enemy will tell you to run away, the Holy Spirit will tell you to come back to me. Come back to me. He'll say, come back. Come home to me. Uh, Don't run away. 
Run to me. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He draws you back to God. He'll say, come on back. Come on. I'm going to help you. Whereas the enemy will say, God is so displeased with you right now. The Holy Spirit, when he convicts us, that's not what he says. He says, I want what's best for you. And then here's the next thing that leads me to this. Number four, he comforts us in our repentance. He comforts us in our repentance. He doesn't want you to feel like you've disappointed God when you sin and repent. He comforts you, and, and he'll say this, I'm so pleased with you right now. When you sin, think about this, you just sinned, you just blew it, you just gave in to sin, and you gave in to temptation, and you would think that God is really disappointed with you right now because that's what the enemy wants you to believe. But really, when you repent, the Holy Spirit says, God is so pleased with you right now. He loves you. Look at how you're growing. It, it used to be so different. You used to sin and you didn't even care. But now you know it's not right. Look at how you're getting stronger. You used to sin and you used to run away from God for two weeks. But now you turned right around and you repented two seconds later. So good. I'm so proud of you. You're my child. I love you. Right? He comforts you and he says, I'm pleased with you. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And then fifth, he leads us into righteousness. He leads us into righteousness. He's going to develop the fruit of the Spirit in us. He's going to change the things that we desire. And you know, that's one of the things a lot of you have talked to me about. You've said, you know, when I became a Christian, uh, at first I used to wrestle with some things. And now it's weird. I don't know what happened, but the things I want are starting to change. I'm starting to desire sinful things less and want different things. That's crazy, isn't it? That's because the Holy Spirit transforms you from the inside out and he develops the fruit of the Spirit in you. The love and joy and peace that God has, the goodness and, and kindness and gentleness and even self-control. That ability to control yourself, it's not because you got so much more discipline, but it's because the Holy Spirit is developing this fruit in you as you endure in him. He loves you and he changes you from the inside out. Listen, church, let's all just admit together, I'm not perfect, I'm a work in progress, yeah. all right? So if you came to church today, maybe it was just to hear, we're all a work in progress. And I love that King David knew that. He wrote in Psalm 23 about God. He said, he leads me along the path of righteousness for his name's sake. That means that God is going to lead me into righteousness so that his name will be honored and glorified. That's good. That's good news. That means I can celebrate. I can celebrate being a work in progress because the fact that I'm a work in progress, it proves that God is in the process of a supernatural transformation in me. It is a supernatural transformation in you. You're just a work in progress? That's okay. That's a miracle. Next time you face temptation, I want you to stop and tell yourself the following. God would love me the same if I did this or if I didn't. So next time you're facing temptation, you're like, oh, I want to do this thing. I know it's not right, but I, I want to do it, and I know I shouldn't. I want you to stop and tell yourself, God would love me the exact same if I gave in or if I resist. Because he does. He does. The fact that you fall and give in to temptation does not cause God to love you any less. Because he never loved you for what you could do. He loved you for what Jesus has done. He sees you in Christ Jesus and Jesus in you. When he looks at you, he sees the perfection and righteousness of Jesus shining through you. And do you know how you grow stronger to resist temptation? I'll tell you how. Ephesians says, allow your roots to grow down deep into God's love and that will strengthen you. So when you remind yourself, God loves me the same whether I resist or fall, the reminder of God's love is going to give you strength to persevere. It's going to carry. And if you do fall, if you do give in to sin, you've already reminded yourself where to go. I'm going back to the love of God. I'm going back to the Father who loves me and accepts me, not because of what I do, but because of who I am. I'm his child. I'm his daughter. I'm his son. He loves me because of what Jesus has done for me. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, I thank you for this word. God, I thank you for this example that we can learn from and the example of Jesus 
that we can aspire to. Thank you for the promise that you would help us in our weakness. Lord, I want to pray for everyone here right now. Anyone who's facing and struggling with temptation, God. And I know how it can be a difficult struggle. And then the enemy will try to condemn us and tell us that you're disappointed in us and that you don't love us anymore and that we're terrible Christians. But you say something different in your word. And I pray that right now your Holy Spirit would remind the hearts of your sons and daughters that you love them, that they're yours, that you have already adopted them into your family. And that is an irrevocable action. They are your children. You are pleased with them and that you will give them the strength to resist temptation, that you are doing a good work in them, that you will carry through to completion, God. It's not up to us, but you're going to help us get there. You're going to carry us through, and you're going to love us along the way. In Jesus' name. Let's, let's just keep our heads bowed for a minute. If you have never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or maybe you did once a long time ago and then you ran away from him for years and you need to come back, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. The Bible says that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are not perfect. We are not right in God's eyes. We cannot do anything to change our status, but that God sent his son Jesus into this world and that he lived a perfect life that we could not live. Then Jesus went to the cross and died in our place. His blood was shed to pay the price for our sins so that God could forgive our sins, knowing he had already punished Jesus for our sins. Then God brought Jesus back from the grave and he was risen to life again, proving that God gives us victory over death and the promise of eternal life is secure through Jesus Christ. So when we call on the name of the Lord, we have the promise that we will be saved. It's not through what we do. We cannot be good enough. We cannot earn it. We receive salvation as a gift through Jesus Christ. So let's do it right now. If you need to take that step of faith, I'm going to lead you in this prayer. Pray this with me. Say, God, I need you. I need your forgiveness. I believe Jesus died on the cross in my place, and I believe he rose again. I give you my life today, Lord. I want to live for you from this day forward. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for helping me. Thank you that you have never forsaken me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God is good, right, church? We love to celebrate. And I want to celebrate with you. If you just prayed that prayer and accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'm not going to embarrass you, but I am going to celebrate what God's just done in your heart. And I'm going to ask you to shoot your hand up on the count of three. If you just prayed that prayer, don't be embarrassed. Be bold. One, God loves you. Two, welcome to the family. Three, just shoot that up. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Great. And Awatsuki, so good. God is so good. Amen. Come on, let's give him praise one more time.